I'm delighted to be here. Uh, many of you know me. I've been uh, uh, kicking around for a few years here at Penn State, um, and uh, I try to come to medical oncology, Cancer Institute Grand Rounds, uh, as much as possible, uh, because this is really the the kind of professional setting where you know uh, call, uh, people like myself envision ourselves. We are surgeons. The coffee and the pictures I'm going to show will prove it, but um, we're oncologists too, and I think that's uh, really important. You know, this is where I identify, um, and uh, the the audience that I want to talk to. And so I wanted to just give you a little glimpse into what. Uh, we do and uh, how we think about it a little bit. This is not a uh, bench to bedside talk. It's more of just a uh, sit back and look at some pictures and, and uh, hopefully get a sense of uh, our side of the, the, the fence. Um, and, you know, we all find that we get into our worlds and we don't remember kind of uh, what the rest of the cancer treatment landscape is like. And so I'll give you a little sense of that. Um, I like to feature uh, pictures, and so the diagram on the uh, cover is uh, some beautiful anatomic uh, artwork by Frank Netter. So the Frank Netter uh, Atlas of Anatomy was the, the Bible uh, for most medical students, but certainly for people going into surgery, and, and I still have it, and I still refer to it all the time, and so always study your anatomy. That'll go, go get you very far uh, in life, and especially in surgery. Uh, I have no disclosures. Um, any of you who've been on the wards with me know that I make all of the medical students and the residents draw pictures of the surgical anatomy. Every case, every single time. If you don't understand the anatomy, you cannot take care of the patient. You can't understand what complications they might have or how to take uh, a, a proactive approach to their future care. And so one of our uh, erstwhile medical students had a lot of different colored pens, um, and she drew this beautiful diagram uh, of uh, classic uh, pancreatic duodenectomy, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and you'll understand every squiggle uh, by the end of this talk. So uh, I put some learning objectives uh, on the sheet for CME. We'll try to get to those. But this is my outline. Um, I think you have to understand the backdrop for pancreatic cancer, the demographics, uh, the idea that this is a poor prognosis cancer uh, with late detection and view, few options for uh, screening. Um, patients who get this disease already have multiple strikes against them. And then there's this profound nihilism about the disease itself uh, and about surgery for the disease. Pancreatic cancer operations, we'll talk about what they are all about, their outcomes, some of the complications. We'll talk about multidisciplinary treatment, touch a little bit on uh, how we think about borderline and locally advanced disease, uh, neoadjuvant therapy. Uh, I could spend hours talking about neoadjuvant therapy. I won't today, but we'll just give you a glimpse. And then uh, something that's near and dear to my heart. Unfortunately, uh, with the best of surgical hands and the best of uh, medical minds treating pancreatic cancer, we still do poorly, as I'll show you on some of the slides. And so I think we need other things uh, to help advocate for our patients and to help them through this difficult time. And I'll talk to you about some of the things I do outside the traditional medical sphere. So you know these uh, statistics that get updated every year. Uh, new cancer cases in the United States, uh, males on the left, females on the right. There are 56,000, close to 57,000 new pancreatic cancer cases. We barely make the top 10 overall, uh, you know, getting just on the board uh, in, in terms of females. But unfortunately, uh, pancreatic cancer is uh, very high on the list of pancreatic, can excuse me, of cancer deaths. So 45, 46,000 people die of pancreatic cancer every year. And whenever the uh, death toll uh, approximates the incidence, you know that you have a problem because not too many people are surviving this disease. So more bad news in the press. CNN is always good for that, unfortunately. So uh, you've all seen this curve from a couple of years ago. Uh, in 2016, pancreatic cancer surpassed breast cancer um, as the third leading cancer killer in the United States, and by 2030 uh, is slated to be the second leading cancer killer, and that's uh, because the progress we're making in other cancers is so much greater than what we're making in pancreatic cancer, and so we are being left behind, unfortunately. Um, 
I happen to treat the two cancers that have the highest uh, slope uh, upswing on this curve, and so I'm uh, in a particularly uh, uh, difficult position, as you can imagine, as are many of you with me. Um, more bad news. Um, I challenge you on that uh, page to find any numbers as low as the numbers for pancreas over the last five almost decades now we are making infinitesimal progress I guess relatively we're making a lot of progress doubling uh, the uh, survival but overall pancreatic cancer has the worst survival of any solid tumor by far and uh, we are not uh, making fast enough progress um, in terms of treating this disease and finding uh, cures for this disease. So why is that? Again, this is all very familiar. Um, there's no screening test for pancreatic cancer. It's a low incidence cancer. I'll show you a slide in a second uh, that I stole from the breast cancer literature, but that proves the point where you, when you try to have a screening test for a low incidence cancer, you get a lot of problems. Uh, there's a late appearance of symptoms, and so by the time uh, we note that a patient has anything uh, worrisome for pancreatic cancer, uh, it is often too late. Rapid growth and spread, although the pancreatic cancer has probably been in the patient's body for years by the time we diagnose it, uh, once we know it's there, there's usually a very rapid growth and spread. And so this is a, a graphic from one of the um, uh, society's pancreatic cancer foundations in Europe, and uh, I thought was particularly uh, useful to sort of understand some of the pains and these uh, some of the symptoms, and these are protean. Every one of these symptoms can be caused by 10 other things that are much, much more common than pancreatic cancer. And so we uh, often, um, even when patients have symptoms, we figure things out late. So why is screening so difficult? You all know this. It's basic statistics. If you have a rare tumor with a low incidence, I stole the pictures from the breast cancer literature. I apologize. But uh, um, if you have that and it's not easy to find, define a risk at uh, a group that's at high risk, then you're at a very high risk for false positive when you implement a screening program in any large subset of the population. And so here you have a thousand women uh, where 10 of them will have breast cancer out of the thousand, so 1%. If you have a screening test uh, that picks up 90% of the people with cancer, you'll pick up nine of the 10 with breast cancer and that'll be your true positives right over here. But unfortunately, uh, 99 of the people you'll screen uh, will turn out to be positive because of the uh, uh, risk of false positives with the test. And so you'll have a, a very large problem on your hand of people who are uh, getting tests, um, stress, tests with complications, and maybe a misdiagnosis um, for no good reason. So there's a little bit of hope, I think, um, on the screening front for pancreatic cancer. This is some recent work out of Suresh Chari's group from the Mayo Clinic. They have a very unique situation where in Olmstead County uh, in uh, Minnesota, they have very good public health records. So they took a population-based cohort. They found people with new onset diabetes, and then they started looking at other characteristics, which will help them enrich the population, find a high-risk cohort which can then be considered for screening. So some of the things they looked at was the change in the blood glucose, change in weight. Obviously, we know that age is a risk factor for pancreatic cancer. And if you put those things together into this score in a patient who already has new onset diabetes, uh, they were able to kind of enrich their cohort and come up with a, uh, a group that is at very high risk on the left here, uh, an intermediate risk group, and a low risk group. And the low risk group in this, again, relatively small population-based study had no cancers in, you know, in that group. The high risk group, 80% uh, risk of cancer. So, you know, this is taking a population risk of cancer, pancreatic cancer, 0.1%, a uh, new onset diabetes cancer risk of 0.9%, then they were able to enrich to a group that has a very high risk of developing cancer. And then, you know, obviously the logical um, endpoint is that you screen those people. And so this needs to be reproduced in other uh, populations and uh, in other uh, refinements, but I think there uh, gives us a little bit of hope for a way we might be able to figure out with novel biomarkers attached to this, uh, maybe a way to find pancreatic cancer early. Okay, so 
this is my patient and your patient, um, but uh, we all know that the patients who come to us um, have a lot of strikes against them already. So uh, the median age for most GI cancer patients is greater than 70. Pancreatic cancer is uh, nearly 75, and so the patients are elderly. They have multiple comorbid conditions. They are frail, sedentary, and obese. It is central Pennsylvania after all. Um, and they're debilitated by this recent on onset of illness. Uh, unfortunately, these aren't cancers that we find, you know, in the shower with a lump. Right? These are found because the patient's profoundly uh, having troubles eating, losing weight, having nausea and vomiting, poor nutrition as a result. Then they go through sometimes months of diagnostic procedures, some of which cause complications and so on, by the time they get diagnosed with a pancreatic cancer. This is just some uh, data from our cohort here at Penn State. Uh, these were survivors of our GI cancers, um, uh, and we have a very high percentage uh, with excessive sedentary time, so 42%, very high percentage not meeting physical activity guidelines, 79%. Um, and so there's a, a cohort here that don't meet guidelines, have excessive sedentary time. They're basically <coughs> on the couch all the time or in their bed, 38% of our patients. And so you can imagine the difficulties doing a major operation, giving toxic chemotherapy, giving advanced radiation to these patients. We all know this because we deal with it every day. Add to that surgical nihilism. So now you have the multiply comorbid patient who's frail and sick and not doing well. And then there's this systemic nihilism, not just about pancreatic cancer, but about pancreatic cancer surgery. This uh, paper I quote all the time because I found it uh, profoundly uh, upsetting. This is from the National Cancer Database, so a population uh, uh, database uh, looking at claims data for cancer. These are stage one pancreatic cancers. Um, only 28% of stage one eminently resectable pancreatic cancer patients er ever got surgery. Of those who got no surgery, a large percentage of them had some reasons. Some were completely unknown, so you know, one in six of these patients, no clear reason why they didn't get surgery. And about half, or more than half, were never offered surgery. Well, you know, I have no uh, illusions that you know these hands are the only thing that cures cancer. But look what happens when you don't offer surgery. You take the stage one pancreatic cancer patients and you give them a pancreatectomy. Well, these aren't great survival curves, right? 27% five-year survival. Um, and, but if you don't offer surgery, you basically have the same survival as somebody with stage 3 or stage 4 pancreatic cancer in this cohort. And so surgery is a key component uh, to pancreatic cancer care. And it, there is a lack of surgery or a kind of uh, <coughs> underuse of surgery. And so we <coughs> need to do better at getting the message out uh, some of these operations, you'll see, um, do have a high morbidity profile. Uh, they used to have a high mortality profile, but that has changed, and I think some of the message hasn't gotten out there, and so we need to get it out there. Um, every time I sort of uh, have one of these uh, papers, I think, oh, it's getting old now. It must be getting better. But um, this is, uh, unfortunately, a decade with very little progress. So the paper I showed you on the left is from 2007. Um, and there's a new paper that just came out last year, Correlates of Refusal of Surgery uh, in Non-Metastatic Pancreatic Cancer. So stage 1 and 2 pancreatic cancer patients here offered surgery, uh, similar, you know, pretty uh, decent outcomes, uh, but no treatment or some treatment but no surgery, and the outcomes are basically uh, abysmal, and as you'd expect for patients with advanced stage disease. Okay, so... I'm a surgeon, and I take care of patients by operating on them, but I can't do this alone. And in fact, my uh, ability to do things has been tremendously improved over the last 20, 30, even over the last 10 years by advances in all aspects of cancer care and diagnostic care and so on. So I'm the surgeon. Uh, we always keep the patient at the center, but we need everybody in this diagram. And so 
I benefit from improved surgical techniques and better ICU care, and my anesthesia colleagues can, you know, keep patients uh, uh, well with low fluids and, and really manage them well interoperatively. Technology has gotten great. I have an interoperative ultrasound that lets me find the borders of the tumor and cut just as much pancreas as I need, and I have other things that help me limit blood loss and so on. But I need everybody in this room. So uh, gastroenterology and radiology have always been our partners in diagnosis of advanced GI cancers, and uh, really uh, Dr. Moyer and his group are the cornerstone of diagnosis for pancreatic cancer with their uh, advanced endoscopic technologies, uh, newer imaging, and then our interventional radiology college, of, of course, um, help us uh, every day and get us out of trouble, a lot of the complications of pancreatic cancer uh, surgery are managed now by others, non-operatively, um, in a large percentage of cases when before we had to take patients back for major uh, morbid operations. Um, the people in this room, medical and radiation oncology, uh, uh, doctors, of course, are really helping us with improved therapeutics and technology, targeted therapies, precision medicine. Uh, we have so many better options for treatment of pancreatic cancer, and I'm not going to go into a lot of the data, but we all know uh, that we are making progress, slow as we saw earlier with some of the demographics and the survival curves, but uh, progress nonetheless. Please remember, uh, it's all over the NCCN guidelines, um, and thankfully is mentioned there, but pancreatic cancer is a complex disease that's best taken care of uh, at high volume institutions. The, this is the data for surgery. A classic paper from John Berkmeyer and his group at Dartmouth when he was at Dartmouth, uh, published in the New England Journal. Uh, across uh, about 10 different major operations, they showed a very stark uh, relationship between uh, excuse me, hospital volume, they also showed it later for surgical volume, uh, and mortality. Uh, and this has later been shown for complications and hospital stay and uh, adjuvant therapy. All kinds of things are better in high volume centers because the people are used to dealing with these diseases every single day. And in pancreatic resection, this was the steepest of the curves, the difference, five fold difference um, between mortality in a low volume uh, hospital versus a high volume hospital is very striking. And it's important for all of our patients to understand this and not seek care um, at the places where they do uh, pancreatic cancer care, uh, you know, as a one-off uh, once in a blue moon. Okay, so now the picture show. You know, again, uh, I'm here to tell you a little bit about what we do, how we think about what we do, and give you a sense of, of some of the operations. These are very big operations uh, with a uh, significant morbidity profile, even in 2019, and so I think it's important to understand those. So. Um, not too much gore, so just in case anybody's eating breakfast. But uh, so this is our uh, classic presentation of one of our patients. Um, if you, I always ask the medical students to pick off, you know, six different abnormalities on this uh, uh, CT scan, single cut. They don't get to scroll, um, and I won't do the same here. Uh, but I'll show them to you. There's a hypodense mass here, uh, right in the head, an uncinate process of the pancreas. Um, now, as we get more cuts. Uh, you see some of the classic findings of a patient with pancreatic head uh, cancer. This patient presents with uh, intra and extra hepatic biliary ductal dilatation, as well as pancreatic ductal dilatation. And so that's the classic double duct sign. These pancreatic head cancers uh, very early can obstruct the confluence of the bile duct and the pancreatic duct, and that's how we find them, unfortunately. Uh, uh, tumors that are in the body and tail of the pancreas uh, can grow much bigger because there's nothing for them to obstruct. The symptoms are minimal until they're quite large or quite advanced, and so we find those much later than tumors in the head of the pancreas. And so there's a double duct sign. The patient has a hypodense mass in the pancreas, uh, in the pancreatic head, has a dilated gallbladder, has a pericholecystic fluid, intrahepatic and extrahepatic biliary ductal dilatation. So very classic picture. If you see this in a person uh, of a certain age, it's pancreatic cancer until proven otherwise. So everybody knows this guy, right, of, of a certain age. This is the classic commercial from the 70s. Don't squeeze the Charmin. This is Mr. Whipple, but not quite Dr. Whipple. This is Dr. Whipple. Um, he was a surgeon for Columbia. He gets all the name credit, but there are plenty of people before him that did uh, even the same operation or uh, parts of this operation. Dr. Whipple performed a series of pancreatic head resections 
in the 1930s, and uh, the first ones are actually done in, in a staged manner, um, but he gets credit and gets the, the name recognition for the Whipple procedure, which is this. You know, I like the cartoons. Uh, no fancy pictures for me. You draw it out, and you sketch it out for the patient um, right there, and you show them what you're going to take out. Um, we'll come back to this later. Unfortunately, patients don't remember what I draw for them, um, but at least they've heard it once. So um, a classic pancreatic duodenectomy involves taking out all these organs on block because they share a blood supply. So the pathology is here in the periampullary region. So the ampulla vater is the valve where the bile duct comes in to the duodenum in the head of the pancreas, and that's a classic place where you get periampullary malignancies. So the most common is pancreatic cancer, but also true ampullary cancers of the valve itself, bile duct cancers that are distal, uh, and occasionally duodenal cancers. And so all of these can be treated with this operation where we take out the pancreatic head and the duodenum. Uh, we usually take out the antrum of the stomach, <coughs> the distal bile duct, and the gallbladder. And, and uh, these all share a blood supply. This is done on block with all the regional lymph nodes. Uh, and the specimen comes out. And then you have some work to do. So uh, unlike other operations where you take out the tumor and you're done, here there's a lot of reconstruction. And so uh, important things, the patient wants their pancreatic enzymes to still flow into the intestines for fat absorption. They still need bile. And so you have to create a hepatico or a cholidoco jejunostomy to uh, hook the bile duct back. And patients like to eat. And so we have to put the stomach some cases the duodenum if we do a pylora sparing whipple um, back and connect it uh, to the jejunum so patients can eat and so uh, usually we talk about half of the operation for taking the tumor out we'll talk about some of the ways that can get difficult in a second and the other half for reconstructing um, and then uh, then the patient's kind of whole and long term Outcomes from this are very good. Most people can eat normally. Most people uh, have uh, excellent, uh, you know, physical activity and absorption and uh, all of that. Um, there are uh, some issues, as you can imagine, with uh, removing the pancreas. So about 25% of people long term will develop diabetes or worsening diabetes, and 30 to 40% may develop pancreatic enzyme insufficiency, um, which can the insu enzyme insufficiency can be easily uh, uh, remediated with uh, uh, enzyme capsules. Um, but these are important things to watch out for long term. But long term, I always talk about uh, patients having the potential for an excellent quality of life. The problem in pancreatic cancer is cancer recurrence, and those short-term outcomes sometimes um, are uh, compromised. We'll also talk about uh, uh, short-term outcomes in terms of perisurgical uh, morbidity and mortality in a second. But um, this is what it looks like. You take all this stuff out. you got a big hole. Um, you take a piece of jejunum from further down, and then you hook it up uh, to the three uh, different organs, so pancreatic jejunostomy, cholidoco jejunostomy, and then gastro jejunostomy for a classic Whipple. Um, <clears throat> so the Whipple procedure is kind of the poster child for a complex operation with a difficult morbidity profile. Indeed, probably in the 60s, uh, this operation had a 25% mortality rate, maybe well into the 70s and, and uh, beyond that. Um, it's only since then that we've really uh, gotten to the point where we're facile at doing this. Uh, mortality rates in major centers are 1 to 2 percent or lower. Um, I've been here for 12 years and our mortality for whip procedures is well less than 1 percent. Um, but morbidity is still high. So overall, all comers, I'll show you some data in a second, but I usually quote a 40 percent chance of some complication that alters the postoperative course. Maybe it just slows you down by a day or two, but maybe a major complication. So uh, some of the common complications are listed here. Delayed gastric emptying, the stomach doesn't work well after we re- uh, configure it and hook it up. It's thought to be a neurohormonal thing. It takes a while for that um, signaling to sort out. Um, and so some patients have significant issues with eating in the immediate post-surgical period. Pancreatic uh, ductal leak is one of the hallmarks and one of the Achilles heels of pancreatic surgery. The remnant pancreas, the part that you leave behind, is usually normal. And that means it's soft and it doesn't take sutures or staples well. And so it's very hard to keep that uh, hookup um, from leaking. And these enzymes can then digest things. And so we worry about uh, postoperative infectious complications and occasionally hemorrhagic complications. 
any and all other complications can happen. Again, these patients are frail and old and multiply comorbid. They get heart attacks, they get strokes, they get all that, thankfully very rarely, but they do get all that stuff. And so you have to be aware of that and you have to have a very uh, careful team taking care of these patients post-op. Um, <clears throat> some of the issues with this operation, this is technically challenging because of the anatomy. So the New England Journal um, had a nice review on pancreatic cancer a couple of years ago and they uh, made a point to kind of uh, talk about this uh, spectrum that can make these tumors uh, go from resectable, so easily removable with a straightforward you know, uh, complex but straightforward Whipple procedure to unresectable. Obviously, patients with distant metastasis, we don't resect. But even other vascular involvement and progressive vascular involvement makes these things uh, less resectable. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, we have three categories um, for these patients. So if you're not metastatic, you're either resectable, borderline resectable, or locally advanced. And even an August journal, like the New England Journal, um, sometimes gets it wrong. So this diagram is terrible. This SMV and SMA come out in front of the duodenum, not behind. I'm not sure how that got through the editor. So I put my own picture up there um, to replace that, because uh, I found it very upsetting. Um, OK, so let's talk about this um, borderline. It's a weird term, and there's a lot of literature out there uh, about it. Uh, what does it really mean? And it's a little bit in the eye of the beholder. In fact, there's no less than five uh, or six different classification schemes for borderline resectable tumors, which you can imagine makes even surgeons go nuts. Uh, imagine the rest of you guys trying to understand this. But basically, in a, as a concept, these are tumors that involve the mesenteric vasculature and for which resection would be compromised either by surgical margins or would be more difficult because we have to do a vascular resection and reconstruction adding to the morbidity in the absence of preoperative therapy. And so borderline resectable and locally advanced tumors, which are by definition unresectable, should get preoperative therapy with the hope of trying to shrink them and then removing them later, even if you can't uh, get rid of the need for a vascular resection. Hopefully you make it easier, you have a less chance of a positive margin, and you can do vascular resections uh, as needed. We'll talk about that. So uh, everybody needs an NCCN slide. Um, the NCCN took a lot of the classifications uh, that were out there already from various societies and tried to put them together. And we still don't agree on a lot of these, but they did uh, put together some um, uh, criteria for borderline and locally advanced or unresectable tumors based on arterial and venous involvement. And the bottom line is venous involvement usually can be uh, mitigated or uh, removed or uh, taken care of with, the, with an operation. We do vascular vein resections all the time with pancreatic resections. Arterial resections are very rare, very few and far between. There's not a lot of great data to support arterial resections for pancreatic cancer surgery. And so generally, those arterial involvement makes things local advanced or unresectable. Then you get problems with terms. Our radiology colleagues are wonderful, but everybody, you know, it's a little bit of an art. So you look at the vessel and you say there's abutment or there's pinching or impingement, teardrop, flattening, shifting. I actually took this slide from a, a talk given by uh, Chuck Bolmer um, and uh, describes all these uh, great terms we use, but nobody knows what they really mean. And so they try with degrees of encasement and so on to make it more objective, but it's still hard to know exactly what these things uh, are and borderline sometimes in the in the eye of the beholder. Okay, so to add more complexity, it's not just anatomic things that may sh make patients not great candidates for surgery up front. So MD Anderson is one of the world's leaders in uh, sort of defining these issues and pushing for uh, upfront therapy for pancreatic cancers. And they have this classification, which I think is very useful, now a decade old, talking about borderline isn't just vascular, isn't just an anatomy, that's borderline A. But patients can be considered borderline, may be considered that they would benefit from neoadjuvant therapy if they have a biologic reason not to operate on them. So if a tumor marker is super high, we expect that that patient has micrometastatic disease. Even though our scans haven't picked it up, I'd rather give that patient neoadjuvant therapy. If the patient has indeterminate uh, pulmonary uh, lung lesions that could be metastasis, uh, and large lymph nodes outside the field, other reasons to consider they might have metastatic disease. 
Type C is for medical conditions. If they have a hemoglobin A1C, which is 12 and a half, if they uh, think they can stop smoking and if you just give them another three weeks, you know, they'll, they'll stop, I'll take it. I will do anything to kind of get my patient fit for the operation beforehand to decrease complications afterwards. And that's this whole idea of prehabilitation. And I take that very seriously and will uh, push patients off, operations off if I have a good alternative, good neoadjuvant therapy option uh, in those situations. So back to our patient, if you look, uh, those astute in the room, notice that this tumor was abutting this circle, which is the superior mesenteric vein. And so a lot of these tumors, despite our best efforts, involve the vasculature. And so what then do we do? As I told you, venous resections are actually quite, quite common and uh, can be done with minimal increased morbidity. They do increase morbidity a little bit, um, but this is done quite regularly to get a negative margin. Dr. Dixon did one of these this week. We do them probably in 20% of our uh, Whipple cases. And so you have a tumor here. This is the pancreatic body and neck, which are normal. This is the aorta and the celiac axis. This is the portal vein going up into the liver over here. Splenic vein and SMV, and these this peeling the head and uncinate process off of the blood vessels is the hard part of the Whipple operation. And so here you see it's made even harder by the fact that this tumor is encroaching upon this side wall of the SMV. If you try to peel it off, either you'll get into major bleeding or you'll get a positive margin or both. Um, and so uh, what we do is we clamp it, we cut it out, and then if it's a small enough defect, we sew it back together. If it's a bigger defect, we put a vein patch. Um, and that's a very uh, relatively straightforward thing to do. What if the defect's bigger? involving the confluence of the uh, portal vein, SMV, splenic vein, a little bit more involvement, circumferential involvement, so on and so forth. You can't just cut a little piece and sew it together. You need to take out a piece of the vein. And so if it's a small piece, you can put it back together primarily. If it's a big piece, you can put an interposition graft. You can take the jugular vein. You can take, um, a, if the patient has a big enough saphenous vein, you can take the left renal vein, uh, or you can take a, a graft and put it there to try to replace uh, a piece of the SMV. So these are, are quite commonplace. Um, this just gives you the kind of all the different options. So from a small repair to a side bite to a primary reconstruction to an interposition and interposition with plugging the splenic vein uh, back in, each with a little more complexity. But we do these quite regularly. Um, so I'll get back a little bit to this idea of extended resections, but first let's talk about some other operations, get back to the show and tell. So this lady um, had uh, breast cancer and was getting screening, one of our patients, and lo and behold, the screening CT scan uh, revealed a pancreatic tail mass. Dr. Moyer or one of his colleagues put a needle in it, found that it was adenocarcinoma. Here you can see a hypodense mass. The normal wispy kind of contour of the pancreas here goes away and it becomes more solid. Um, and there's stranding and inflammation around here. This is a pancreatic tail mass nestled in the hilum of the spleen. You can't see it on this cut, but maybe involving the splenic vein and splenic artery as well. So what do you do? Well, you can take that out with a left-sided or a distal pancreatectomy. You always have to take peripancreatic lymph nodes uh, and usually the spleen to get the splenic hilar lymph nodes. So you used to remove resectable disease in the tail or the body of the pancreas, removal of the pancreas, um, the lymph nodes, and often the spleen. Um, lower complications profile. We don't have as much reconstruction. We have no reconstruction to do here, but a, still a major issue with pancreatic leak, 15 to 20 percent from the uh, stump of the pancreas where you've cut, problems with bleeding and infection uh, and other things post-op just like any other pancreas case, but a lower uh, complication profile as I'll show you in a minute when I give you a summary of, uh, of the morbidity and mortality of these operations. Um, so that's kind of what it looks like. We have something in the middle of the pancreas. We get out around the pancreas a little bit to the patient's right of where the tumor is. We often use an ultrasound to map the contour, map the blood vessels, find the pancreatic duct, and figure out where we're going to safely cut the pancreas away from the tumor. Um, 
there's this concept that pancreatic cancers don't uh, uh, abide by the capsule, and they can very quickly uh, get into the lesser sac anteriorly or into the retroperitoneum posteriorly. And so this concept of this radical uh, modular pancreatic splenectomy, they needed the acronym to be RAMPS rather than R-A-P-S, so they, they called it uh, pancreatic splenectomy instead of splenopancreatectomy, but whatever it is, the idea is that you can't just go right behind. So this is the body of the pancreas and the tail, and the idea is you don't want to go right behind it because that's a plane too close to where the lesion might be, and so you stay in this retroperitoneal plane. You actually get into Giroda's fat in the perinephric space, and you kind of enucleate the kidney so that you stay a plane away from the tumor posteriorly. If you need to, often these more medial tumors will involve the adrenal gland, and so you take the adrenal gland as well, uh, and then you uh, are able to get a better cancer operation. So uh, once you identify your location, you transect there, you can do it uh, by hand and suture it. You can use uh, electrocautery equipment. Uh, often nowadays we use staplers. So that's kind of what it looks like in the end. This uh, stomach is in the way, so we have to move it out of the way. We cut the pancreas. We take the vessels, the pancreas, and the spleen uh, with all the lymph nodes. That goes in the bucket, and then there's no reconstruction to do, so you're, you get to finish early that day and uh, uh, still have to watch the patient closely because all the complications we talked about, but uh, a little bit more straightforward. Okay, so nowadays we do these robotic assisted, and so minimal invasive techniques I think have made this operation easier because it's hard uh, retracting and getting way up there with your hands, but with the cameras and scopes you see the anatomy beautifully. So this is the stomach. It's peeled uh, and kind of retracted medially and up. This is the colon, so the colon gets pushed down like this, and then we see the left upper quadrant. This is a big uh, pancreatic mass. This was actually a solid pseudopapillary tumor in a teenage uh, young girl. Um, back here somewhere is the spleen, which we're not seeing well in this picture. This is the anterior abdominal wall, and this is normal pancreas. And so if, as we keep going, we do the same operation, minimally invasively, as we would open. We do the same lymphadenectomy and so on. We use an ultrasound to map the edge. This is the tumor here, and then we're seeing some of the vessels behind, and we go till we don't see tumor anymore, and we take a little bit of a margin, and then we map, uh, mark out the pancreas here with this cautery. So that, we know, is where we're going to transect the pancreas. The stomach is pulled away. You can see uh, blood vessels in the lesser sac. So now we have the pancreas kind of isolated, medial to the tumor. We get around it, um, just like was shown in one of those pictures, and then we can transect it. Sorry. And so uh, this can be done uh, straightforward. And then you have to take the tumor out, so you can take it out through a slightly enlarged incision here or even a fan and steel incision here. And so the patient has small incisions and less postoperative pain. Um, <clears throat> the problem with these body and tail tumors, though, is that they can uh, very quickly involve the retroperitoneum. And as I talked about, there's no bile duct to obstruct in the back of the pancreas, and so these often present late. So here is a pancreatic body and tail mass that's now engulfing this blood vessel right here, which is the celiac axis, provides all the blood flow to the foregut, so the stomach, the liver, and the spleen and pancreas, and so a pretty important artery. Um, turns out, though, you can live without it. We'll show you how. Um, so this operation, called the Appleby procedure, or distal pancreatectomy with celiac axis resection, can be done in selected cases of a pancreatic body and tail tumor that involves the arteries. This is considered an extended resection. It's one of the few cases where I say you can do an arterial resection. It's a little bit crazy and can be quite uh, anatomically difficult and can have uh, you know, a fair bit of morbidity attached to it, but it's something for selected patients. We give every one of these neoadjuvant therapy. They have to be responding. If they respond, we consider doing this in the, in the right patient because it can be, you can get negative margins and, and can prolong uh, survival with this operation. And so it involves a left or distal pancreatectomy, with splenectomy, regional lymphadenectomy, but now a celiac axis resection and sometimes a vascular reconstruction as well. So you would ask, how do the other organs live? Well, the pancreas and spleen are removed, so they're going to be okay. The stomach, liver, and uh, the duodenum have to live off of collateral blood supply. 
that go back to this artery through uh, the SMA distribution. So they kind of go through the head of the pancreas, this artery eventually dilates up and you get blood flow to the liver and to the uh, stomach pretty nicely even after this operation. Um, so here you are. Um, this is now an axial view. You're taking the body and tail of the pancreas and the spleen. You're cutting here right in front of the kidney like I showed you before. You're usually taking the adrenal gland and you're going right onto the aorta and taking the celiac axis. But then you're leaving the distal hepatic artery so that blood flow can come through those other collaterals to the liver and then eventually get to the stomach. So that's what it looks like from the front. You cut the hepatic artery, you take out this tumor and the celiac axis kind of all together. All right, and that's kind of what it looks like. You pull the stomach up and you've got a big cavity there and a, uh, a stump of the celiac axis there. This is not my picture, um, but kind of a, a nice dissection, but just so you, you can you know, uh, realize we do this as well. Uh, this is one of our pictures. This is the common hepatic artery stump uh, and the gastroduodenal artery, which where, is where the collaterals come from. This is the caudae part of the liver, the portal vein and SMV, and we took the splenic vein right there. So the pancreas would have been here, and it's all been removed all the way down to the crur of the diaphragm. Okay, so total pancreatectomy, you can imagine there are occasionally times when the tumors are multifocal or too extensive, or you have a pre-malignant lesion, an IPMN, that involves the whole pancreas, then we'll think about taking out the whole pancreas. This is actually an easier operation to reconstruct because you don't have to make a pancreatic anastomosis. Remember I told you those are the ones that leak, so we're uh, happy about that, but it's a more morbid operation for the patient because now the patient doesn't have insulin but also doesn't have glucagon and so they're more prone to this brittle diabetes where they can go both high and low and requires careful control. Still, we can have very good long-term quality of life. We have patients with insulin pumps who do really well uh, managing their uh, insulin. Their obligate uh, pancreatic enzyme um, you know, requires as well so we have to give them those. Okay, so what do these operations look like? This is a modern uh, evaluation, 2012. These are data from the NISQIP, the National Surgical Quality Improvement Pro uh, Project. Probably some of the best data on surgical complications, and these are national data. If we take left pancreatectomy, Whipple, and total pancreatectomy, these are our uh, mortality rates. 2%, these are national. 3% uh, and 5%. Again, high volume centers should be lower. Serious morbidity and any morbidity. So I still quote 40%. We're actually down to about 34% for uh, any complication for Whipple patients. But I round it up and I, I still quote the patients 40%. Um, there's a lot of back and forth about uh, extended resections and vascular resections and multivisceral resections and do they increase complications, should they be done, and so on. I think uh, we actually published this paper um, uh, from our group here and showed that uh, there's a pretty clear increase in morbidity um, for these operations. Still can provide survival benefit, but you have to understand they do come at a cost. And so you pick your patients properly, uh, pre-select with neoadjuvant therapy. You do uh, have threefold increase in rates of morbidity and, and uh, death after these operations compared to standard pancreatic resections alone. Okay, so I'm just going to briefly talk about neoadjuvant therapy. We all know, and you know, medical oncologists talk about this in all kinds of different tumors, and so um, that's a topic for another time. But we know that neoadjuvant therapy can be used to treat micrometastatic disease, uh, to ensure that patients undergo multimodality therapy, to also ensure that patients who aren't going to benefit, meaning those who progress, don't get this big operation with all the morbidity still in 2019 that we have. And potentially, we downstage and improve our uh, R0 resection rates. So there's some pretty, uh, it's an exciting time because there's more and more data coming out and some of the prospective trials of neoadjuvant therapy are finally maturing. This is, I think, the best uh, uh, population-based data we have. This is from the National Cancer Database. Um, and these people looked at 15,000 patients uh, with pancreatic head cancers. Um, and showed a slight benefit, statistically significant, but only about three months uh, for the neoadjuvant therapy com uh, group compared to upfront resection, um, but did show benefit, you know, in, in a large cohort. More importantly, there are uh, prospective randomized trials. Whoops. 
that are happening, uh, the first of which are getting reported. So this was at ASCO GI this year, a Japanese study using S1 and gemcitabine uh, in the neoadjuvant setting versus surgery plus adjuvant therapy as the control arm. So here's the schema, uh, neoadjuvant therapy versus upfront surgery, uh, matched groups of patients and improved overall survival in the uh, neoadjuvant therapy group. So really the first demonstration of neoadjuvant therapy for resectable pancreatic cancer. Remember, we've been using it for borderline and local advance for a long time. Uh, this is a study with chemo radiation from the Dutch uh, pancreatic study group uh, from ASCO 18. So neoadjuvant uh, GEMSAR followed by GEMSAR plus radiation followed by GEMSAR and then surgery versus surgery with adjuvant therapy. Um, again, a uh, survival benefit there, um, but not quite statistically significant um, in the intention to treat group, getting towards statistical significant in, in uh, the group that actually got the uh, R, R0 resection. So a lot more studies out there, a lot more data to come, and that's a great topic for another time. Um, this is one top, uh, picture I need to show you is that we do know that completion of all phases of the therapy, whatever you're planning to do, whether it's chemotherapy plus surgery, surgery plus chemotherapy plus radiation, getting everything is much, much better than if you don't complete it. And so one of the benefits of neoadjuvant therapy, we think more people are getting chemotherapy, surgery, and then maybe even the adjuvant therapy versus surgery up front. There's a lot of drop-off because of surgical complications. A lot of patients don't get adjuvant therapy or have delays in adjuvant therapy. And similar trends are seen in lung cancer and in colon cancer and so on. To get all the intended oncologic therapy, we want to try to give neoadjuvant therapy. Okay, so for the last five minutes, I'll just talk about some other things. Um, as I talked about, despite all our efforts, despite everybody's efforts in this room and all the researchers, pancreatic cancer has an 8% five-year survival. And these hands, you know, I love operating, but they don't cure cancer very often, right? And so I think there are other things I need to do, and a lot of us need to do, to try to improve the lives of our pancreatic cancer patients um, that uh, actually find fun um, and I think uh, meaningful as well. And so I'll tell you about some of the things we do. Um, obviously, awareness is important, right? We light up our crescent purple and we wear our purple all through November and we're trying to, uh, uh, you know, kind of make purple is the new pink in my eyes, right? So uh, uh, get out there uh, with our marketing campaign. I do uh, try to get out there as much as I can in the press and talk about why pancreatic cancer needs more research, why we need more awareness, why people need to listen to their bodies, get their symptoms checked, why new onset diabetes is such an important issue for patients. This is one of our uh, now, I think, a seven or eight, nine year survivor of pancreatic cancer who was gracious enough to do an interview. This is uh, me on Smart Talk, which is one of my favorite programs. Um, I also try to raise awareness about the generalized issues of cancer survivorship. For GI cancers, their issues are particularly acute, but every cancer patient has survivorship issues, and there are now close to 20 million, actually, it's an old slide, uh, cancer survivors, and so we uh, are coming up on uh, National Cancer Survivors Day in June. It's important to increase awareness of this. Um, survivors um, have this great gift that they've survived cancer, but they have long-term effects from their treatments, they have after effects, they have survivor guilt, there's all kinds of psychosocial, emotional, spiritual issues that happen uh, and that we need to be aware of and help patients through. Um, that's why we need a big cancer team that kind of uh, provides all the support and we're working to create an even better kind of hub for these services uh, here at our Cancer Institute at Penn State. Um, so raising awareness of pancreatic cancer survivorship, I think, is important. Um, silly things. We give a certificate when somebody uh, leaves our clinic and, and uh, is no longer, uh, no longer needs to be seen. But I think it helps to kind of uh, uh, improve awareness. Um, some of you may know that I do a lot of stuff on social media. It's like one of these things of mine. And uh, at times it's silly, but I actually think there's a real benefit, and I'm a strong believer. And I'll tell you a little bit about some of the things I do in the pancreatic cancer space uh, that I think uh, can be really helpful. So um, you all know that social media is user-generated content shared over the Internet. It promotes engagement, sharing, and collaboration. And I think as professionals, those are the things we do every day. This is just lets us do it on a bigger scale. Um, everybody's using Twitter, 
except some of the people in this room. But uh, <laughs> um, we know that patients are using the internet, right? So 80% of uh, this is old data, so it's higher now, but uh, lots of patients use the internet. Dr. Google is probably the first source for most patients compared to Dr. Claxton. Um, but patients still trust us the most online. So if the uh, information comes from a doctor, a hospital, less so from an insurance or a pharma company, they trust the information most. So I think it's and, uh, imperative for us to be out there providing that good information for the patient to find so they don't find the bad information um, that they can't trust. So some colleagues and I have done some uh, social media outreach. We've done these Twitter uh, pancreatic cancer chats dating now several years. It was called Pank SM, Pancreatic Cancer Social Media. It's a one hour Twitter chat once a month. We put a series of questions up and we have a sort of a discussion back and forth in 180 characters, it's now a little bit more, um, on Twitter and patients participate, advocacy groups, researchers, physicians, it's a very lively chat. Um, I'll skip some of the details, but the idea was to uh, provide that forum. Um, there are other chats in breast cancer and lung cancer that are tremendously successful that I modeled ours after. And uh, it sort of provides a um, online chat room, kind of a support group uh, in, in space. And it's easier for people who are far flung in small communities who don't have a support group at their cancer center or in their, in their town. Um, there are a bunch of these for different types of cancers and are uh, really a um, important adjunct, I think, um, to other you know, real life support groups. Um, I'll tell you a little about, about one chat we ran. We run a surgical intervention for pancreatic cancer chat about once a year. The topics rotate. So um, this was from last April. So you know I'm one of the hosts of this chat, and the engagement is phenomenal. So uh, these are kind of the statistics, the leaderboard. So uh, the number of tweets you put up, impressions is a metric of how many people see each of these pieces of information. So some of these. Uh, uh, Twitter pieces of information have thousands and thousands of impressions and overall you know millions of impressions so there's a lot of eyeballs on this thing what they do with them we don't know but the point is you can get to a very big audience very quickly with these forums and I think that's part of the power of it this is some data from Deanna Tai who actually gave grand rounds here last spring one of my good friends in this space um, from her breast cancer support group they did a survey of the patients found that 80 percent increased their knowledge a bunch of them sought second opinions uh, a great majority of them had decrease in anxiety and 72 uh, percent you know sought advocacy or outreach as a result of the breast cancer social media chat so I think there's a, a great role for these types of things um, so we have best practice guidelines on how to be safe on social media that I participate in. I think it is important. Um, but uh, the bottom line is it's out there. I'll tell you one more uh, anecdote. There is a, uh, we'll skip back to this. So there's a Facebook support group um, for patients who've had the Whipple procedure called the Whipple Warriors. And it's mostly patients, about 6,000 worldwide, and they're from everywhere. And they do a roll call every now and then so you get to see where everyone is. And they talk about everything. It's amazing what I learned just as a consultant to this group. I don't participate because it's their space. Occasionally, we'll have a forum where a couple of the physicians on it will answer questions. But mostly, I just learn. And they talk about symptoms. They talk about some of the after effects. They talk about not even knowing what organs they have left. Even though I know I drew all those diagrams and spent an hour talking to them, they don't remember because they heard the C word and then they stopped listening right afterwards. And so you learn a lot by being out there where the patients are. And they're talking whether we're there or not. So we might as well be there learning from them. Um, I'll close just with a uh, couple cartoons. Um, you know, social media has kind of uh, got this impact, uh, reputation for being kind of silly, you know, and isn't real world uh, research and all that kind of stuff. And it's true, it's true. But, you know, it is a, an important currency in 2019. Um, so I'll close with this. Um, this is shared with permission from one of my patients, and he just sent me this uh, letter with excerpts from his Facebook page. Um, and then I, I blanked out some stuff that was identifiable. So uh, he wanted to take a picture with me at our two-year mark because he remembered I had told him that the first two years were the most likely, you know, for him to get recurrence. And so he was very happy. And 
in honor of this or to celebrate this, he was going to start running again. So he'd run, he used to run a lot before surgery, hadn't really run a significant amount. And so he just sent me this this week. He just ran a half marathon uh, just a few weeks ago and um, did well despite some Charlie horses and so on. But this is really what we're looking for, right, is improving uh, uh, patients uh, cancer survival, but improving their quality of life, getting back, getting them back to what they want to do. And so I found this uh, tremendously gratifying. So um, that's all I have. I'm happy to take any questions um, or uh, any comments.